certain games just stick with you. Weeks, months, years, and even decades can fall off the calendar, yet you always remember that experience that you had. If that right game clicks with you, it can leave a lasting impression for the rest of your life. A lot of the times, these titles are incredibly obvious, games that are so good, not just in the gameplay, but the art style, the music, the memorable moments found throughout. They really are the entire package. Today, I plan to talk about a game that was released during the big Doom, Quake and Duke Nukem days of the mid-90s PC gaming scene before getting ported elsewhere. A game that understandably isn't quite as popular as those titles, but at the same time, if you played it back then, even if you've never played played it since, it left a lasting impression on you. And although it may seem like I'm clutching at straws here, I'm pretty sure that everybody out there that completed MDK back in the 90s would agree that this title deserves its rightful title as legendary. I, like many, hold on to that memory of playing MDK and thoroughly getting absorbed into the weird, twisted camera movements. The HR Geiger-inspired imagery, and even after completing it, looking into the brilliantly stupid story that my mostly console-based background had never seen before. Plenty of games in both the first-person shooter and 3D platform genres have come out since this title, and even though they may have been better, ask anybody that has actually played this game, and they will tell you that hardly any, if any, at all have ever been able to replicate the magic of the coil suit. So, let's go back to the beginning and find out exactly why this game is so legendary in MDK, the complete history where we'll be looking at the game's roots, how it got made, how it almost didn't, its failed movie, its surprising sequel, and of course, the games too. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. But before going ahead, let's give a big old shout out to this video sponsor, Extra. So Extra are a company that recently sent me a couple of these rather lush smart wallets that not only come in a beautiful box, but are wrapped in an incredibly high quality European leather. Not only can you put cards in the slots here, but you can also put them right here. Whoopee! Your cards fit snugly with my demonstration of five personal cards. I mean, these bad boys are not coming out. And of course, they are housed with RFID protection so you don't get digitally too bobbed. And a nice tight strap for all of you people out there that still like to carry cash. On top of that, you can also get the extra tracker, which fits nicely into the back of the wallet and works as a tracker not only to find your wallet with your phone, but also it works the other way around to find your phone with your wallet. Like what you see? Then why not check out the full extra range on their website by using the affiliate link below. Welcome back to the early 90s, ladies and gentlemen, 1992 to 1995 to be exact, where this gentleman right here worked on his most iconic content. In this order, he worked on The Terminator in 1992, Global Gladiators the same year, Cool Spot in 1993, Aladdin the same year, Earthworm Jim in 1994, and of course, Earthworm Jim 2 in 1995. This, just like Disney, was his renaissance period. Now, in retrospect, some of these games are arguably more great memories than they are great games. I'm looking at you, Global Gladiators and Cool Spot. But still, they all played well, they reviewed very well, and I own them all. David Perry and his crew are the people that we need to thank for these titles. He and his team had built up a reputation that was well deserved as some of the best in the business when it came to 2D platformers, which is why Sega had stopped the in-development Aladdin and pushed it onto his crew to rework, which they did, and it ended up being one of the best-selling games on the system, and his own gaming development company, Shiny Entertainment, that he founded in 1993, whose first game was Earthworm Jim, designed with Doug Tenapel of course, became so incredibly popular that it spawns not only a very popular sequel, but a kids TV show, a toy line, a set of Marvel comics, and there were even talks in Hollywood of creating a movie too. Thank God that didn't happen. 
A lot of the team at Shiny Entertainment left after the release of these two games to form their own company, The Neverhood, which left David Perry and his slightly smaller crew of industry veterans to start working on Shiny Project No. 3. An idea originally put forward by close friend and long-time work colleague Nick Bruti, who according to interviews randomly came up with ideas that didn't always make a whole lot of sense. I want to create a game that gives the player the opportunity to shoot the enemies from a huge distance with so much accuracy that you can successfully aim the bullet directly into their eyeballs. Sure, not every single one of Nick's ideas actually made it into the games, but I'm sure if you go back and play games like Earthworm Jim and Cool Spot, you'll see that in fact some of his ideas did in fact make it into those games, and this was one of those times. The two had met by chance many, many moons beforehand and instantly clicked working on Trantor, the last stormtrooper which looked and played incredibly smoothly on the old Amstrad CPC and ZX Spectrum, and over the years the evolution of their incredible 2D graphics became even more refined. In short, 2D platform games just looked smoother when they made them. They created a technique that would reuse sprites from hand-drawn imagery without the use of any extra memory, which resulted in plenty of extra frames of animation giving them a certain cartoony feel that even the best in the business struggled to replicate. I'm sorry Cuphead, but Dave and Co, they did it first. There was just no denying that these guys were probably the best and that's why when forming Shiny, David Perry personally went after people that were proven masters in the 2D platforming game. However, as great as it was to start your company with such a legendary game and its sequel, something I'm sure David, Doug and Nick were all incredibly happy about, it was what came next that really did change the mood at Shiny Entertainment. You see, 2D gaming was on its way out. Not only were we already seeing the 16-bit era's desperate attempt at making games 3D, but the Sony PlayStation and the Sega Saturn were already out in certain parts of the world, and then of course you have the often overlooked world of PC gaming that had been doing this sort of stuff for many, many years. Because of this, David invested some of his own money into some brand spanking new silicon graphics units and gave them to his team, who seriously, seriously struggled with this new 3D art style. Thankfully for the ones that left from the Earthworm Jim days who went to work on the Neverhood game, which was obviously their next step for the genre, Shiny actually hired so many more people to work in this new 3D environment that the new team was actually twice the size of the original team. Still, it was a frustrating time. They had some of the best and well-proven individuals in the business, and now they needed to chuck away all of that knowledge and experience and, well, start again with these big, beefy, fridge-looking silicon graphics machines. It was like watching people paint with broken hands. I mean, they were just banging their heads against the table. They just hated it. And you have to remember, this was back when 3D Studio Max was pretty junky. So you've got this team who are used to drawing things with a pencil, trying to use this thing. It was very difficult for me to watch. On top of this, there was obviously the problem of whatever they're going to be doing next. And Nick was a sci-fi guy at heart. He still had that idea of shooting things in an eyeball from a mile away idea. He got a bit of paper and he started to doodle down some rather dark imagery. I was having fun on those titles, but feeling the itch to go back to my sci-fi roots. It was in the middle of crunching on Jim that I took a break and just started doodling. Before I knew it, I had drawn this futuristic spy character hanging off the side of a building with a gun attached to his face. The earth mining was really about aliens doing business dealings, just as we do on Earth. There was no great alien takeover, just a good old backing, stabbing business. Yep, all these 90s cartoony games are indeed getting on top of Nick, and Earthworm Jim 2 in particular was the last straw. In his eyes, the instant jump from 1 to 2 resulted in a game that wasn't quite as good as it could have been. He, and I assume others, wanted at least a 6 month break between games, but there was no getting away from the huge popularity that the Earthworm provided, which was why Earthworm 2 started production immediately. 
As a result, these eerie, almost HR Geiger looking drawings became an addiction for Nick, and with the go ahead from David, they started to develop the idea of MDK, a game where you play as a lonely janitor to a brilliant scientist named Kurt Hectic, whose name, by the way, was taken from the lead singer of Nirvana and the movie Naked featuring David Fulis. When the lead character asks another character, what's it like in your head? Ectic, which was probably what was going through Kurt Cobain's head at the time. Hence the name, Kurt Hectic. And it's your job to make your way to several floating city ships that are killing billions and billions of people on Earth every day and basically kill them before they split Earth in half with your arm cannon and face sniping helmet. It's one of those weird stories that if you did only see concept art, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. The idea was odd, the execution from an almost entirely 2D platforming house was scary, and these pictures honestly erase your mind, pretend you don't know what MDK is or how it plays, because without seeing the gameplay, the story and these images make absolutely no sense whatsoever. Regardless for the unaware at Shiny, everything was actually coming together in their eyes with the game's design and they decided to try and pitch it anyway so they could get some money behind the project and get the ball rolling. Which as you may have guessed, didn't turn out all that great. Concept art and storyboards would be slapped all over the table and then they would invite the men with the money in to hear these ideas and quite understandably, the men in suits had absolutely no idea what the hell this game was about. They went in probably expecting the next Earthworm Jim and instead they got a guy in a skin tight gimp suit with a gun on his head that didn't make any sense. They were very, very confused. Also, it didn't help that on the same day the verdict were coming in from the OJ Simpson trial and according to an interview with Nick, the confused businessmen got up, they walked out to hear the verdict and they never came back. This was when Shiny realised what they were doing just wasn't working. The concept art and the story just didn't really make any sense. So they went off and made a proper concept trailer so that they could showcase to the next group of people exactly what they were going for. And to all of those businessmen that just wanted whatever the next Earthworm Jim may have been, what better way to start off that trailer than by showing them that this is not what you're going to be getting. From the company that brought you the critically acclaimed and award-winning Earthworm Jim comes MDK, the next generation of video game. Welcome to the future. thing about this concept trailer was that a hard drive failure happened the day before the presentation which completely wiped it and in a desperate attempt to get it back they were only able to recover the first two minutes completely leaving the final one minute as a pixelated mess. It 
didn't matter. The trailer was so good, it did what it needed to. The men with the money liked it so much that they never even noticed the drop in quality towards the end. And from that moment on, proper production began on MDK for Windows 95 and MS-DOS users. Even though the game was a PC game first and a PlayStation game after, which we will get to in a bit, it's evident when playing it that these game developers came from a console gaming background. The end result is a game that many critics at the time, who by the way absolutely loved the title, put it into the Doom, Quake and Duke Nukem 3D category that was blowing up at the time for PC players. Sure, it's not technically a first-person shooter, but you can definitely see that inspiration shoehorned into a typical console gaming mindset. The entire team were fans of these games, but coming from a platformer background, they knew the importance of actually being able to see your character. We wanted the player to see all of the cool actions the main character would be performing, so third person was the natural choice and challenge we went for. Platforming, as you would expect, actually plays a rather big role in this game, as does solving certain puzzles. The humour of Shiny is seen throughout as bad guys mock you for not being able to reach them, and in between sections between the larger levels, which technically act as a way to cover up loading times, can easily be compared to Andy Asteroids from Earthworm Jim. And of course, the always surprising and always changing and always brilliant soundtrack from Tommy Tallarico definitely adds to that concept console charm. Even though the game is completable in no more than 3 or 4 hours, or even less when you know what you're doing, the journey getting to that final boss is never boring. The game is brilliantly fun, even 20 years after its release. Sure, it's been beaten in its gameplay style since then, but thankfully its unique feel when you can actually get it to work on a PC, its over-the-top dark gothic tone and its very obvious shiny-like humour results in a short but thoroughly enjoyable experience. Because of this, a game that mostly consisted of the same strafe-heavy shooting was never boring. Just like most standard platform games from the 16-bit era, it was rather easy to finish but it offered up so much more variety than you may expect. It takes something that looks serious and completely takes the out of it. To get the game looking even better, they decided to include motion capture so that the 2D sprite of the main character would look even more lifelike in its dark and dingy world. I mean, seriously, it's so good that I honestly forget that this is a 2D sprite half the time. And although the making of the booklet that actually came with the PC Big Box version talks about just how good that motion capture was, in an interview with Games TM via the Wayback Machine, Nick tells a slightly different story. We wasted a small amount of budget on a very early motion capture system that completely failed to work in any way. However, we got to make Tim Williams dress up in a leotard, so it was almost worth it. To this day, MDK is a game that I like to pick up and play every four or five years or so, and when I do, I'm always reminded at just how much fun it is to revisit the world Nick Bruti and the rest of the team at Shiny envisioned. Its pixelated landscape 2D main protagonist, its stupid story and borderline gross art style makes this a timeless classic that although it's overshadowed by Shiny's previous work, still leaves a lasting impression on all who play it even today. Some could even make the argument that the PlayStation release of the game is even more iconic as it was ported by Neversoft from the ruins of an unfinished game called Big Guns, not exactly from the ground up but utilising this already in production game and by doing this they were able to give MDK an even more jagged in certain areas but extremely colourful in others version of the game that I have read in quite a few instances a lot of PlayStation 1 adopters actually prefer. For me, it's always going to be the DOS release. I do understand where PlayStation fans are coming from, you know, each to their own. 
Playmates, who were responsible for the Earthworm Jim toy line, had visions on turning the MDK franchise into a toy line too, although they wasn't too thrilled with the idea of trying to persuade Toys R Us to stock toys that are essentially called Murder, Death, Kill. I mean, that's what MDK stands for, right? Murder, Death, Kill? The short answer is yes. Heck, you can even see it in the game's concept trailer, but Murder, Death, Kill is never mentioned in that final game itself. And this was done intentionally by the marketing department, who had a lot of fun spreading rumours such as Mission, Deliver, Kindness, and best of all, Mother's Day Kisses. Shiny knew that simply calling the game MDK would not only get people talking about its mysterious name, but it also gave them the ability to be able to market it for toy lines and movies, stating that MDK actually stood for Max, the six-armed robotic dog from the game, Dr. Flux, the mad but brilliant scientist from the game, and of course, Kurt, the main guy. And before moving on, whilst we're talking about movies, now's probably the best time to actually discuss how MDK almost got a proper movie adaption. Whereas the same discussion was had by the Jim Henson company to create an Earthworm Jim movie, Universal obviously stopped that whilst it was just an idea, as they owned the rights, and of course it would have had to have been distributed at the time by Columbia. The MDK movie, on the other hand, did get a whole lot closer to becoming a reality. The team behind the popular kids TV show Reboot were going to be the ones behind this one. And at the very last minute, when everybody was together, the head of Interplay simply just didn't want it done and refused to sign the check. But if this did go ahead, MDK would have been going up against the likes of Flick the Ant at the box office. MDK had some seriously stiff competition in the PC space, yet it sold really, really well. Not as well, of course, as previously mentioned games, but it proved that Nick and his team of awesome game designers did indeed make something that was indeed incredibly memorable. It sold well, it reviewed very well, and despite it not being a blockbuster, as Nick put it, it did well enough for Shiny to instantly do what they did before. Greenlight MDK2 instantly. Everyone wanted us to do MDK2 straight away, but I wanted a break from it. I hadn't liked rushing from Earthworm Jim to its sequel without a creative break, and I felt the game suffered because of that. Plus, on top of this, just like before, he had already started coming up with the concept of his next game, which would be Giant's Citizen Kabuto, which Interplay agreed to fund, so he went off and did that at his new studio, Planet Moon Studios, while Shiny gave the MDK license to Bioware, who, in my opinion, did a really solid job. Just don't tell Nick I said that because during a Reddit MDA promoting his Kickstarter for the game First Wonder, when asked if he liked what Bioware did with the franchise, he replied, I didn't play the game, not that they didn't do a great job from what I've read, and I know them to be great guys, but it was always going to be a different style and hard for me to see that. I hope to do my own sequel one of these days. The game was officially announced on October 18th, 1998 as a direct sequel to the first for the Dreamcast and Windows PCs, and although everybody was in shock as to how this young development team that hadn't even put out a game before was given such an awesome license to make a game with, those doubts quickly blew apart when they finally played the sequel. And it's obviously worth noting that Bioware, although in their final stages of the legendary game Baldur's Gate, had not yet released it. Greg Zaschuk, the founder of Bioware and producer and designer of this game, was a huge fan of the original. He understood what made the game great, 
but at the same time he knew how to make it better. No real story was given during the first game, no real history for the intriguing looking main character was given and of course the game was just too short. He wanted to address these issues whilst keeping up with the incredibly high bar of quality that Shiny had set and in an interview with IGN he goes into more detail regarding this. I can't even begin to explain the strength of the visual influence that the original MDK has over MDK2. I was very impressed when I first saw MDK and I'm even more impressed after having played it many times. In many ways, in MDK2 we're striving to reach the goal Shiny set with the original by using new and improved technology. When going back and looking at both these games now, I personally think that the second game has actually aged a lot quicker than the original, even though it is a longer game with more playable characters and an awesome story that's a lot more obvious this time round. I personally don't feel like it has the charm that the original has. Sure that may be nostalgia, but I'm not so sure. Honestly, I had both of these games back in the day and if you are slopes from the year 2000 what was the best, I would have said MDK2. Nowadays, I think I'm more of a fan of the original. Look, I'm not taking away anything from MDK2. If the original is a 9 out of 10, then MDK2 is an 8 out of 10. They're both really, really solid games. My only suggestion to newcomers is that you play them in order. In MDK2, the minigames have been replaced with extra characters with different play styles, the battleground areas are noticeably smaller and although it is definitely cleaner, especially in the MDK Armageddon and MDK2 HD re-releases, you just can't beat the gritty nature of the original. MDK2 has three different play styles, which all play quite uniquely. The game has a lot more platforming involved this time, including certain sections that will leave you scratching your head endlessly, trying to work out exactly how to get them to work. The dog Max has taken over as the pure go crazy gun firing lunatic, and the professor, who is obviously the weakest with his toaster gun, yes, a toaster gun, is all about the puzzle solving. The classic Kirk Hectic sections, which thankfully take up the majority of the gameplay, are a good mix of both, and although he looks a little different this time round, they still play the same for the most part besides the occasional suit power-up. As stated, the game was followed by MDK2 Armageddon, which is essentially a slightly bug fixed version with a few extra additions, such as the ability to choose a difficulty, and of course MDK2 HD is the low poly black and white version for the Atari 2600. No. Wait. Depending on what you're going for, the best way to play this is either via the HD version on Steam or the WiiWare version on the Wii if you can get that version to work. Personally, even though the graphical style is slightly gimped to make for a steady frame rate on the Wii system, the Nunchuck and Wii Remote combination really does make this quite fun to play through. Anybody that's played a decent first person shooter using these controls will understand what I'm talking about. But again, both versions play brilliantly and of course it really does come down to what you want from the game. In 2006, it was announced that a third game in the series would soon be in development, alongside sequels to Earthworm Jim 2, Descent and Dark Alliance 2. The reason all four were bundled together like this was so that Interplay could start collecting up money for an MMO set in the Fallout universe, which they predicted to be a $75 million project. These four sequels did pop up several more times in interviews, but since 2008, MDK3 was never heard of again, and although Mike Bruti has stated several times that he would like to make a sequel, that time has never come. It has now been 20 years since the release of MDK2, taking its re-releases out of the equation of course, and the price of the original big box copies of Shiny's first attempt into the world of 3D gaming have really shot up in price. MDK and MDK2 are not just great games, they are games that stand the test of time, due to the overwhelming style that only a certain group of individuals could ever come up with. Gaming's history is filled with endless amounts of games that honestly are pretty basic, but thanks to that incredible imagery, the excellent music, the eerie vibes and surprising gameplay change ups found throughout what is essentially a 2 hour experience when you get good at it, they leave you with not particularly wanting more, but instead wanting to go back and play over and over and over again. 
The only thing I would love to see from the series in the future is the ability to play it comfortably on a PC or console using a controller without having to mess around in the options menu. The series doesn't need any more sequels or HD paint jobs, it's perfect the way it is. One of PC gaming's oddest and best action platformers. Hey there guys, thank you all for checking out the video. Yes, MDK, I actually did this video because I thought it would be a, a smaller one, an easier one to get out whilst I work on a really, really big one. And I found out so, inform so much information that it turned into a huge episode. I really pushed myself with this, added some colour grading to some of the shots, added some new plug-in effects to hopefully make it just seem a lot more interesting throughout the thing. So if you liked uh, this video, then please let me know down below if you like the changes. Um, always looking to improve, always looking to improve. But yeah, there you go. Thank you all for checking out this video and of course the biggest shout outs go to my Patreon members and YouTube members that support the show every single month and give me the opportunity to make videos like these. Videos I know probably aren't going to do all that well but it just I, I put all of this effort in there and these guys just take off the burden and, and make it so much easier for me. So thank you all so much with an extra big shout out going to... Aaron Gorman, Andrew Dalton, Andrew Ward, Arista, Aiden Wolf, Ben Jackson, Benjamin Guy, Big Rico, Bram Perez, Brandon Gold, uh, Budog18, um, C64 Television, Cheshire One, Krista Wattweiler, Clan Bob, Conrad Constantine, Cromilla, Dan Petit, Daniel Ter Terrazas, Terrazas, <laughs> Daniel, uh, David Yaron, Dina, Dina81, Dr. J, expert in moonology, Elf Daughter Crafts, Game Apologist, Gary Pinkett, Grody Grungus, Hut Intrigued Gaming, Jabba L. Aiden, Jacob, Jacob P, aka Avalon Jane, Jeff Ladd, Jeff Mianowski, Jeremy Rodriguez, JMT5887, Jonathan Hayward, Kevin King, King Link Reviews, Lucas Softel, Lipped, Man of God 9000, Marcus Kimo Cut. Tyndall, Mike Martin, Mr. Golden, Nicholas Burton, Nick Pollard, Nightwill, Papa Zane, Petty Mew, Pilly Von Waldemar, Pretendo64, Pretty With Horns, Ret RetroReversing.com, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, uh, Richard Aldergic, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Digi, Dizzy, RL Sloan Friendly, Competition at Audible.com, Rocket Plod, Ronnie Method SSWB, Roven Army, Ryan Holt, Sashi Dog, Samuel Nielsen, Shadow Dragon, Shadow Dial, Solix Captor, Steven, Sushi Joe, Taylor Rainwater, That Gamer, The Cunning Linguist, The Shaded J, Tim Labonte, Tim Lunn, Todd Paul Float G, Chans Writes, Vike Echo, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, and Ye Old Hamburglar. Like I said, all of these guys right here do give me the opportunity to make videos like this all the time all the time so thank you all so so much i hope you guys are enjoying all of the extra content i'm putting out at the moment i'm still trying to get into two videos a week we'll see if we're going to be able to continue with that and um yeah up next i want to start working on a few more kick scammer episodes uh whilst i've got that complete history in the background that i'm working on you know what i'm talking about the big one i keep teasing yes anyway guys let's end it there this is dj slope signing out and hopefully i'll see you all next time